With all this uh, talk about sex in the Song of Songs, I've said that word a lot the last three months, by the way, um, it's fitting that the song ends singing to us about love. Right, so next week, our last week in the song, it kind of goes back to the beginning of, of the story, and we'll talk about single, uh, singleness and dating, purity, and some of those things uh, again, like we did at the, 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 the first of this series. And so um, this week, so to speak, is the end of the story. And, and, and if the biblical narrative of what we've been talking about, right, the, the erotic intimacy that God gives, if that biblical narrative is better than the way the, uh, the, the story that the world gives, it's because because of this, right? It's because of this covenant um, biblical love that the song is going to sing of uh, th- this morning, okay? Uh, marital love, as we've been saying really this whole series, uh, it is a song about God's love, right? All of Christian love should be a song of God's love, right? God is love, the Bible teaches us. And so marital love should be a song about God's love for us, Okay? Now, love is a universal value, right? You don't have to be a Christian to value love, to uh, want love, to speak of love, to desire love, to need love. Everybody that walked into these doors, no matter how much you doubt God or don't believe in God or you do believe in God, you want love, right? We want love. We want more love. Um, We need love. But when we talk about true love, like biblical love, that's not necessarily the same thing that... um, maybe we talk about in everyday life or, or that the world may lift high as a value, right? The, the, there's, those loves may be different because we talk about falling in love and then falling out of love. That's not love. Right? We talk about loving our grandma, which we should. You should love your grandma. Um, but in the next breath, we talk about loving breakfast tacos, which again, you should love, um, but those are different things, right? They're very close, loving grandma, loving tacos. Um, but they are slightly, slightly different, right? We talk about love as a feeling. Love makes us feel good, and um, it gives us kind of butterflies and, and things like that. That's not exactly really what um, biblical love is, uh, is, is talking about. That, that's not exactly what we mean. When we talk about love, we're talking about uh, biblical love as defined by God. If God is love, then God defines love, right? God d- defines what love is, what love means, and a biblical marriage should be a picture, a song of that love. And so when we talk about love biblically, what we're talking about is there's a self-denying action. There's a self-denying pursuit. And there could be uh, affections corresponding with that pursuit or maybe even as a result of our obedience to that self-denying action, but it's a self-denying pursuit, action, towards another for the good of the other. That's what we mean by biblical love. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life. Greater love has no one than this, that somebody would lay down his life. And so biblical love then is is cruciform, right? It's cross-shaped. That's what biblical love is like. It's raw, it's gritty. It's not this sentimental, flowery, kind of fake stuff that we often talk about, but it's the deep stuff, the hard stuff of moving towards the other, laying down your desires and your preferences and your comforts for their good. That's what love is. It's a love that loves despite the object of the love, right? Biblical love is the the everyday love of a mother. There's nothing sentimental or cute or sweet about changing diapers and midget demons talking back to you. (laughs) Nothing, nothing. Biblical love is the everyday love of marriage, right? It's gritty, it's enduring, it's, it's, it's every day. Biblical love is the, 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 the love of a church, brother and sister to one another where we stick it out even when it's hard, even when it's hard. That's what we mean by um, biblical love. Right? It's gritty, it's real. And it's a love that it flows down and fills over from God's love for us. And so here's my hope for us this morning, for all of us, okay? However you've walked into this place, whatever you believe about God or the Bible, um, however long you've been in church, however long you've been a Christian, if you're not a Christian, here, here's, here's my hope for all of us um, th- this morning. My, my hope is that we would get a tangible taste, 
that we would get a glimmer, a glimpse, a, 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 a taste of God's love for us, like actual love for us, that, that we would be able to sense it and see it and feel it for just a moment. That, that's my hope this morning, that as this song of marital love sings to us, it would point us to God's love for us and, and not in just this way of, man, we know God loves us. No, no, we would know that God loves us, right? That if we could taste of it, maybe it would change our marriages. If we could taste of God's love, maybe it would change this church. Maybe it would change everything if we could just get an actual, tangible taste of God's actual, real, strong love for us. Um, maybe, maybe everything would change. Here's what's been frustrating me about this, though, all week. I can't do that in us. Like, there's nothing that I can say. There's nothing that I could... Uh, that I could do. There's nothing pithy that I could come up with that would produce in you this actual sense, experience of, of God's love. It's really frustrating as a preacher. There's nothing I can do. Like, I just don't have that power. I don't have that uh, 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 ability. I, I, I've been doing this for seven and a half years. I know that I have a gift of preaching. I know that I can take the Bible, uh, even the deep things of God, and, 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 and have it make sense, maybe even somewhat compelling. I'm usually really, really funny. <laughs> See? <laughs> but I know that there's nothing that I can do or say that would make the Spirit of God fall on our hearts, explode in our hearts the love of God. And so it's really frustrating. Like even now I'm frustrated and I'm praying that, that he would just do that. I'm, I'm, I'm wanting him so badly in my own heart and in yours to, to give us a sense of that. Man, the Christian life is a life of faith. Most days we just have to wake up and believe that he loves us. Some days, sometimes, maybe today, he would just, he would explode in our hearts that love and we would know. I, wanna, I want us to know this morning. I want us to know. Other problems of knowing God's love is that there is um, a human problem to understanding eternal divine love. We're just limited, right? We're limited. Um, part of it is because it is so big and deep and wide that we're never going to be able to grasp it. They're just... Um, we're never going to be able to grasp it. Um, the love of God towards us had no beginning and it has no end. How could we possibly conceive of that? Ephesians 1 says, In love he predestined us for adoption. Before the foundations of the world, before things existed, God set his love on you. Ephesians 2 says that for the coming ages and eternity future, he's going to show us the immeasurable grace of his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. It, it literally is eternity past his love has been for us to eternity future his love is for us. How could you possibly understand that? But then there's also this reality that um, God's love towards us can be understood and grasped. It's why the Apostle Paul will pray later in Ephesians, in Ephesians 3, that we would have strength to do that, let me just show you this, show you what I'm praying for and show you what I'm hoping for this morning. Ephesians 3, it says this, that we may have strength, Paul's praying, that we may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, right? That you would know the love of God that surpasses knowledge. He's saying, I want you to know the love of God that isn't just about um, what you know, but it's what you experience. That you would actually be able to sense and experience, have a taste of God's love for you. And we need strength to comprehend a love that is so strong. Most of us, right, this is just a confession uh, for me and, and, and my guess is for us as Christian people. Most of us know God's love like the glimmer of light that comes through that window, right? There's a, a, a little bit of light. It gives off a little bit of warmth, but that's about it. And on some days and certain moments, man, there's a good sermon perhaps or a, a special song. Or you have just a, a good time in the word with, with God or whatever it is. It just feels like a hot Texas summer day um, uh, experiencing his love, knowing his love, 
but we never experience it like it really is on the surface of the sun. Hot, unbelievably hot, his love for us. Right? It's just 100 million miles away we experience his love, but it is hot, it gives off light, light and warmth, it is big, his love for us. How might we experience it? How might we know it? What if he would give us that this morning? And so I want us to worship God this morning in a sermon. I've been praying that I would worship during this sermon. And I pray that you would worship in this sermon. Sermons should be acts of worship as we hear from God. And and maybe he will give us a glimpse, a sense of his love through our worship. And so what we're going to see this morning in this song about marriage will hopefully sing to us about God's love. It's going to sing to us about God's love in three ways, right? Here's the first way. Um, It's it's this. Biblical love is a love that leans. Look at verse 5. Biblical love is a love that leans. Who is this? Um, Who is that, sorry, coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? I love that I love that picture. I feel like we can really see this. Um, This is a Hebrew song. It's written to the Israelite culture. And so this would conjure up images of the Exodus, uh, of God's people being delivered out of slavery uh, in Egypt and, 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 and then into the wilderness and then coming out of the wilderness and into the promised Land, that, that's the picture here, right? Um, uh, love is the promised land is what it's saying, right? A love like this, a biblical love, a leaning love is like the promised land. David in the Psalms will write another song about the promised land saying that, that God is our portion, that the boundary lines for us have fallen in pleasant places, that God's presence, his love is the promised land. Love is the promised land. And that's the picture that, that's being painted. The song that's being sung here is that love is this promised land where we are safe and secure, where there's flourishing and joy and gladness. That's what God's love is like. Right? When you experience the love of God, that's what it's like. Safe, secured, literally doesn't matter what's happening around you. Does not matter what's happening in your life. There's joy in the midst of it. It's the promised land. And this love is, is leaning. I love this stuff. Right? The, the, the leaning stuff of marriage is the best stuff of marriage. Right? The friendship stuff, the leaning stuff, what C.S. Lewis calls mere ease and ordinariness. It's that stuff of marriage where, where, where you're, you're just friends, where you lean on one another, where you need one another in hard times perhaps. That's the, the picture here. We put so much stock in sex, and we've been talking about it for three months, right? The intimacy, it's important, but the intimacy is really just a log on a fire, right? It's fuel for the warmth of marital, covenantal, biblical love. The leaning stuff is what you're after. The friendship stuff is what we are after. This biblical love is what we are after. Friendship, that's, that's a big deal. A lot of couples, a lot of married couples, they started off as friends. If you're single, you should consider the friends that are already around you. Instead of looking for um, somebody out there, what if God has already put that person right in front of you and it's your friend? It's your friend. Good marriages have good friendships. My wife and I had to learn that. We weren't friends at first. We thought each other was cute and that was about it. We didn't really even like each other. Right? And you're, when you're 22, you're cute. When you're 38, you're less cute. You need friendship. Right? You need friendship. We've had to grow in our friendship. Right? But that's the best stuff of marriage. It's the, the leaning stuff of marriage is the best. And it's this kind of stuff, right? that leaning, that friendship, the, the sweet affection, the presence is the, the, the stuff that you need most in your relationship with God too. Right? It's not, you don't need God to give you something. You need God to be leanable. You need the friendship of God, the ordinariness of the presence and faithfulness of God, not to leave you, not to forsake you, to be there um, in in the hard days, right? As a bride, uh, the the church, we can lean on Jesus like this bride is leaning on her husband, right? 1 Peter 5, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. He's leanable. He's leanable. For Philippians 4, right? Don't be anxious in, in everything, Right? Lean on me in prayer. 
My, my peace will guard your heart. My peace will guard your mind. I'm leanable, right? He's leanable. That we can lean on Jesus. And I love that Jesus is leanable, not, not just because I need him, but I do need him, right? I'm utterly dependent on Jesus. I need to lean on Jesus, but I, I love that God is leanable because um, sometimes I'm not for my wife, right? Sometimes I'm not leanable. Um, sometimes when my wife... Uh, needs me, I just try to fix it. Husbands, anyone else? Sometimes when um, she makes what, what Jalea, one of our, our, our leaders in our church, what, what Jalea calls a bid for affection, when she does that, it didn't, like I, I look, I don't look, I don't, I don't look past um, how she's saying it or the way in which it's coming out. I don't, I don't do that. I, I, I'm not there for her to lean on in that moment. I just want to argue. I want to argue about what she said or how she said it. I, I don't look underneath to what she's wanting to communicate or convey coming out of this heart that needs to lean on me. I just want to fight. Sometimes when she's falling over, I'm focused on other things. It's just, I, I'm just unaware and she's not on my on my radar, sometimes as spouses, as friends, as members of a church, we aren't leanable, right? We're unapproachable. We're inhospitable to one another. But Jesus is always leanable. Jesus is always leanable. I will never leave you or forsake you. I know you've heard that a hundred times if you grew up in church. Would you just think about that for a moment? When Jesus says, I will never leave you or forsake you, or forsake you how leanable is Jesus? Wherever you go, Whatever seedy place you find yourself in, whether that's just in your mind or an actual place, right? Whatever precarious situation you end up in, I'm there. I won't leave you. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. It doesn't matter what you need. It doesn't matter how needy you are. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what sin you've committed. I will not forsake you. What of love, what unfailing, faithful, leanable love. And so love is leanable. Secondly, love is strong. Look at verse six, this is intense, right? This is just on fire, this is beautiful. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death. Jealousy is fierce as the grave. Its flashes are the flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Love is strong, he's saying. She's saying, right? Love is strong. Right? She says, put me in your heart, right? Tattoo me on your arm, like seal me to you. His heart and his arm. This is what he um, uh, feels and what he does, Right, this is his inner being and his outer actions. This is uh, everything about him, right? This is all of him then. Um, if this is his heart and his arm, it's who he is and it's how he acts. And what she is saying is everything about you is stamped now with me, right? Everything that you are sealed now with me. I am yours and you are mine and I become a part of you and you become a part of me. That's what a biblical marriage is. It's sealed, Right? It's strong, covenant, unbreakable love. That, that's what it means. That's what marriage is. And in Ephesians 1, the Apostle Paul uses the same language to describe God's love for you. Right? Ephesians 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, it says this, In him you also, that's all of you, okay? All of you, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, listen, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee. How certain is this? He is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. That's when you die, okay? To the praise of his glory. The Bible is saying that um, like a ring on the finger of a bride, but even with more assurance, is God's love sealed to your heart? The Holy Spirit, the very presence of God, stamped to your heart like this bride wants to be stamped to his heart. Sealed in love. You've been sealed in love by the very presence 
of God. It's a love that is strong. What she is saying is that our love is unshakable, it's inevitable, it's immovable, it's impassable, it is resolute, it is fierce, it is strong. And then she gives a similar sentiment when she speaks of jealous love. Jealousy is fierce as the grave. Like think about, that's, that's serious, right? Jealousy is fierce as the grave. As the grave holds the dead, my love holds us together. I mean, as the grave will not let the dead go, I will not let you go. That's what she's saying. Now, Oprah, um, 27 years old, walked away from God because of his jealous love. She heard a preacher quote, uh, I think it was Exodus 20, verse 5, for I, the Lord, um, am a jealous God. And she walked away from God because of that. He's jealous? If God is this egomaniac, if he is susceptible to you know, immature passions like a 20-year-old man, then I'm out. 11 times the Bible talks about God being jealous. And, and she's like, man, forget this. Forget this. But that's not what this is talking about. That's not what the gal here is singing to her husband here about her love being jealous. This is talking about covenant jealousy. This is different, right? This is jealous love, not jealous lust. Jealous lust is immature. Jealous lust says, um, you have something and I want it. It's not mine, it's yours, but I, I want it. I feel like I deserve it. You shouldn't have it. I should have it. It should be mine. That's jealous, immature lust. Jealous love is different. Jealous love is you do have something. You have rightful possession of something. It is yours, and someone is trying to take it from you. The Apostle Paul will speak to the church in Corinth, and he'll say, I feel a divine jealousy for you. Right? He, he's, he, he's meaning I'm protective for you. I, I see that there's things that are pulling you away from the one true God, and I don't, I don't want that to happen. As pastors, I have complete understanding of this. We can see when, 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 when false teaching might be leading somebody astray, when um, uh, the cares of this world start pulling somebody away from God. We can see that. We can see that. That's why I'm praying even now that you would experience God's overwhelming love like on the surface of the sun so you would not be pulled away from him. That's a jealous love. That's a, that's a good love. That's a loving thing to be jealous for where you are rightfully his. I am rightfully his. And he's saying, I will move towards you and against anything else that would take you from me. He is saying that like the grave holds the dead, I hold you. Like the grave will not let the dead go, I will not let you go. That's what God's love is like. It's a love that is a flame of fire. It's strong. 1 Corinthians 13, we read it at weddings, which is fine, but it's talking about biblical love. The love of God towards us and the love that we should have in the church. It says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. Biblical love is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Biblical love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Turn to the person next to you and tell them God's love never ends. <laughs> Biblical love is strong, right? Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sore? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor, nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God towards us in Christ Jesus. Turn to the person next to you and tell them uh, nothing will separate you from God's love. So husbands, wives, listen to me now. This is what we're talking about. Don't let each other go. This is the strong love that we're to sing so that the people around you will see how God loves them. 
Right? This is the strong, fierce love that we're to sing in marriage. So biblical love leans. Love that part. Biblical love is strong. And then finally, biblical love is a love that lasts. Look at verse 7. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. Do you, do you ever feel like you're drowning? So last couple of weeks, I've just, I've kind of felt under, underwater, I'm trying to keep my head above water. And, and you know what's kept my head above water? Love. The, the love of a wife who prays for me. The love of friends who um, they give a listening ear. The, the love of God whose love is like flashes of fire so hot that he burns up any waters that are trying to drown you. It, it's love that keeps us Afloat. It's God's love that keeps us from the flood of anxiety or exhaustion or discouragement. Man, it gets tiring swimming in that, that kind of water, doesn't it? And it's God's love that are flames of fire that can burn up those floods. And marital love doesn't corner the market on this. I mean, biblical love is a love that says, I'm in this with you no matter what. It's a love that lasts through the fire through the flood. In the church, right, covenant relationships, covenant membership, brother and sister who say, I'm gonna love you no matter what. No matter what junk you bring to the table, right? No matter um, how weird you are, I'm going to love you and I'm gonna stick this thing out with you. Many waters cannot quench love. Love cannot be quenched when it feels like you're drowning. Love cannot be quenched in the rains of depression, not when you stumble, not when you fall, not when you sin. The love of God towards you cannot be snuffed out. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, how many of you grew up with a dad who traded work for love? You know, money is one of those things where it can buy everything that money can buy, but it can buy nothing that money can't buy. Money can't buy purpose, it can't buy meaning, it can't buy love, and so it's a really foolish thing to trade for those things. Um, but some of you had daddies that traded love for work. Some of you are husbands that, um, under the guise of this altruistic motive of, of I want to provide for my family, have traded your presence for retirement accounts and stuff. Some of you grew up with a dad who showed his love by buying you stuff, but he was never around. The Bible says that kind of love is foolish and you are to be utterly despised. Jesus literally left his house. He literally left the riches of heaven to pursue you in love, to come after you, to be in your presence. So with the cross of Christ, which is the, literally the crux of our Christian faith and um, the, the, the crux of the cosmos, of the, the, the history of the, the universe, it all kind of comes to this climax at the cross and it is there that we see love. And it's poor, it's sacrificial, and it's the fullness of divine love. It's at the cross that um, uh, God shows us the lengths in which he will go um, to be glorified in us, right? That we would be um, uh, knowers and experiencers of his love and enjoy God forever to glorify God um, he shows us the cross of Christ. At the cross, Jesus is pointing to the Father saying, look at the love behind all loves. You need to know him. Look at how far he'll go. His love for you will last. Nothing can stop him. Nothing will hold him back from loving you. Look at me. 
Right? The cross is that place where the father points to the son and says, look, look, the beauty behind all beauty given for you. It's where God points at us and says, look at how much I must love you. Look at how much I must love you. Of course it's gonna last. Of course it doesn't matter what you did last night. I've been loving you since before the foundations of the earth. You think what you did last night somehow runs out my love? That it can be quenched? You think it can be quenched because of something you did last night? The cross of Christ is pointing to us in all of that. It's telling us how far he would go to love us. That we would, we would look at it and, and maybe in beholding it and worshiping it, we would get this rush, this sense, this feeling of God's love and it would, it would, it would change us. And so pastors, ministry leaders, city group leaders, God's love hasn't run out on you. Just because things seem hard right now and there's discouragement, just because it doesn't feel like there's fruit in your ministry, that doesn't mean that God's love has run out on you. Moms, God's love has not run out on you. Just because it's hard, just because you do have midget demons in your house, doesn't mean that his love has run out on you. God's love has not run out on you just because in the midst of a series on the beauty of God's gift, gift of sex, you have fallen into sexual sin again and again and again. His love still hasn't run out. His love lasts. It lasts. He has always loved you his love had no beginning, and so it has no end. Now, um, if we're honest, our love is so limited. Right? Lean on me, yeah, sure, but, but not if it gets too hard. If it gets too hard, then I think I'm out. If we're honest, our love is weak. It's weak. It's not enduring. It's easy to leave. It's easy to distance ourselves. It's easy because it's weak. It's shakable. It's easily overcome. If we're honest, our love is so fickle. How easily we write off one another. How quickly we bounce from loves to loves, cheap love to cheap love. Thankfully, God's love is strong. Your union with Christ, purchased on the cross, gives you an unshakable, strong love. And so may our marriages sing of that love. May this church, as brothers and sisters, as we love one another, as his love flows over and fills up us, may it pour out over to one another and may our church be a song of God's love. And would God just be gracious to pour out his spirit on us even now, that we would know it, get a tangible taste of it, and maybe even in this place be changed.